keynote speech session, I'm Yi Sing, co-president of the Cambridge University Biological Society, and I'll be the host for today. So I'll be introducing our keynote speaker, and uh, after the talk, I'll be moderating the Q&A session. So um, our keynote speaker today, we are very honoured to uh, have her here to uh, talk about her work on protein misfolding. So she's Professor Jane Clark, a uh, fellow of the Royal Society, and she is a distinguished biochem biophysical chemist recognized internationally for her multidisciplinary studies that have at once the understanding of protein folding and misfolding. And she is the professor of molecular bio biophysics in the chemistry department at Cambridge. She currently leads a research group and she is also the president of Wolfson College, Cambridge. Um, so in her talk today, she will be using results from her studies of intrinsically disordered proteins to discuss her ideas on the importance of disorder in biology. And she will also like to share her opinions on the nature of scientific research itself and the real importance of having a diverse and versatile scientific workforce and reflect on the threats that she thinks uh, science faces today. So without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Clark to deliver her talk. Thank you. Yuxing, thank you. And, and I'd like to thank everybody in, in Oxford and Cambridge and uh, all of you for organizing this conference, which I think is a magnificent um, effort and an, a magnificent initiative, but also to say how very honored I am to have been invited uh, to be part of this symposium. So uh, it's always the, I'm always most excited about being asked to give talks by students. So um, I'll share my slides with you now. Um, can, can you see, can you see them properly, Yixing? Is that okay? Um, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and my title is, is, is Science in the Time of Disorder. Um, uh, and, and, and I'm going to talk in two parts. The first part is going to be mainly, is going to be the science part, which is, which is trying to discuss with you what I think is the role of disorder in biology. Um, why would biology use disordered systems when they could use beautifully structured systems instead? And the second one I want to do is reflect on the current state of science and maybe reflect a little bit about what this pandemic and the disorder from this pandemic as it has done to, to our scientific lives. So here we go, central dogma of biology. You all know this, genes, DNA to RNA to protein. It's what you learned at school. It's what you learned um, in, in your undergraduate studies. And this is, this is how, how biology works. We also know that the, the step after this is, is uh, it's about this in protein folding. Here's a, here's a lovely illustration from a textbook. Here's the building blocks of life, we have to call them, the amino acids. The primary structure of the protein here is this amino acid sequence, which folds to secondary structure elements, helices and sheets, which then forms the tertiary structure, the three-dimensional structure. And then these chains come together to form this beautiful quaternary structures here, which are the functional blocks of proteins. We know because we've done, uh, um, we've got x-ray crystal log, uh, so, so this is, sorry, this is the, the point about this, pro, this, is that we've got genes to unfolded proteins, and then the protein folding problem is why and how does one sequence fold to one structure and another sequence fold to another structure? How does the folded protein give the structure its function? And why don't proteins misfold? And as a biophysical uh, chemist, these are questions of kinetics, thermodynamics, structure and mechanism. And that's what I've spent most of my 20 years of research working on. Um, we know that proteins look like this, they are beautiful. Um, and we know this from X-ray crystallography and, and from NMR spectroscopy. And here are some of the proteins that I've worked on during my career. And we also know from wonderful advantage now in cryo-electron microscopy that these, that these chains come together to form massive machines like this fantastic F1 ATPase, 
which um, is the powerhouse of the cell generating ATP. Um, and this, I mean, this, these structures earned John Walker um, he, in Cambridge his Nobel Prize um, for, for, for understanding how these machines work. And we have beautiful complexes like this nuclear pore complex here, um, which is here's the membranes in, in the sort of around the outside, and these many proteins that come together to form a pore in the nucleus that controls traffic of molecules into and out of the nucleus. So we know that proteins are structured. But about eight, 10 years ago, it became increasingly apparent that many proteins have got large disordered regions. Now, at first, when I started my PhD, we just thought these were just linker regions between ordered regions. But now it's become really apparent that some of these regions are functional and that there are some proteins that are apparently entirely disordered and yet are essential for the biology. And so how do these things work? Why would biology choose to use disordered proteins when we know that folded proteins can do the most exquisite things? And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Now, there are some proteins, as I say, that function while they're disordered or because they're disordered. Do you remember I just showed you this picture, the nuclear pore complex? Well, this is a pore, a selective pore, which selects what goes in and out of the nucleus. And what you will have noticed in this picture is there is a massive hole in the middle. This is not a pore, it's just like a tunnel through which everything could flood. And that's because in the middle of the pore, you could see this here in this sort of diagram of this cross section of the pore. There are, it, the pore is full of disordered proteins. Now, of course, you can't see them in a, in, in a crystal structure because they're not structured. They're very mobile, highly mobile disordered proteins. And it's full of these, and these are called nucleoporins, nucleoporins. And it's these nucleoporins here which control the flow of, of, sub, of substrates in and out of the nucleus, from the cytoplasm into the nucleus, from the nucleus out. And the question is, how do they do this and how they do, do they do it so successfully? Well, one of the things that we have looked at um, in my group is Sarah Shamas, who was... was, was um, uh, one of my postdocs in my group, uh, 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 and we did a study looking at how these very dynamic proteins allowed ultra-fast trans um, transport through this pore. I'm not going to tell you a lot of detail about this study here, but what you'll notice is this was a, a huge collaboration with, we used NMR, NMR we use single molecule fluorescence, we use molecular simulations, we use biophysical techniques, and we, we, we applied in-cell single molecule tracking to find out what was going in this complex. What did we found? So we studied the interaction of the transport receptor with these nuclear porins and saw how, how these interactions work. We discovered that when this nuclear transporter reception interacted with these, they still remained flexible. So they didn't act as a block, but they allowed this thing to flexibly go through. But specifically, because it's specifically bound to these small phenylalanine glycine repeats that are found all over this. And they allowed, it allowed that these interactions were very, very fast. So I've told you, and, and, and you could follow up these details. I'm happy to send the slides to anyone if it's interesting, but that some of these disorders, some act when they're disordered. But what I'm most interested in is, is disordered proteins that fold upon binding to the ligand because I'm interested in protein folding. So we have studied intrinsically disordered proteins that fold upon binding. And again, the big question is why, why would you? If you're working when you're folded, why would you bother being unfolded in the first place? So one of the ideas that we have is that if you're unfolded, you can be promiscuous. Now promiscuity might not be a thing we want to encourage at the moment in universities with, um, with COVID uh, 
spiking up uh, and all these new students coming. But promiscuity can be really important in biology because it allows you to have complex inter interaction networks. Um, and one of, the, one of the systems I'm going to talk about a little bit is this system here, the BCL2 family, which controls apoptosis. This controls programmed send cell death. And this is a really, really important system in cancers. And mutations in the BCL2 proteins I'm going to talk about here um, can result in cancer. And so many cancer drugs are aimed at, at these BCL2 families of proteins. Right, so how does this, how does this work? Well, um, in normal conditions, when the cell is doing fine, you've got some pro-survival BCL2 proteins here which in, interact with these proteins back and backs, which are pro-apoptotic proteins, and they interact together and the cell is spied. Now, what happens when you get cell damage and the oncogenes are activated is that you get these proteins here called BH3 proteins, which are disordered. These interact with the pro-survival proteins. They take the pro-survival proteins away from back and backs. These are now free to punch holes in the mitochondrion, and then you don't downstream, you get apoptosis. Okay, so how does this work? These BH3 proteins, what are they? So here are the BCL2 family proteins. Uh, there are pro-apoptotic ones, and there are, and, and are anti-apoptotic ones. And in each of these, we've got many, many, many different families. And the important thing to realize here is, all of these can interact with all of these. So you've got multiple proteins that can interact in many different ways. So we decided to have a look at these, um, at these interactions. Um, and we took several of the, of the disordered proteins, which fold into a helix when they bind. And we took one of the um, BCL2 proteins and we looked at the binding. And we found that all of these could bind but with an enormous difference in affinity. They could bind from, from, with a KD of sort of 30 picomolar up to, to, to sort of 0.2 micromolar affinity. So a huge range in affinity. And interestingly, they all bound equally quickly, really quickly, um, a K on of sort of 10 to the six per molar per second. So almost diffusion limited binding, but with extraordinarily different off rates. So in other words, the affinity is determined entirely by the lifetime of the complex. So by having systems where you've got very disordered proteins, you can get them to bind quickly, but have extraordinarily different properties once these complexes are bound. So you can have signaling systems if you use disordered proteins, where you have, you, you could be really adaptive according to what you want that signaling system to do. And you can only do this if you've got disordered proteins where you can tune the affinity really over orders of magnitude by very small changes in sequence. A second reason for being disordered is to be responsive to changes in, in cellular conditions. Now, if you take a folded protein, you find that folded proteins are stable over a huge range of temperatures, over a huge range of pHs, over a huge range of ionic strength. But the same isn't true of disordered proteins. Disordered proteins and the, the interactions they make are exquisitely sensitive to changes in conditions. And here's one example, uh, which is the, the work of Basil Wicke in the lab, where he showed that addition of salt can ex significantly change the residual structure of intrinsically disordered proteins. Now, although I'm telling you they're, dis it, they're disordered, it doesn't mean to say they don't have some structure sometimes. They are... Yeah, yeah, they're disordered, they're wiggling around, and then occasionally you get a little bit of helix, which then melts away. What Basil was able to show in this experiment was how much these intrinsically disordered proteins are, are affected 
just by one thing. This is ionic strength. This is circular dichroism. You saw in this experiment, you shine polarized light on, on, onto the protein solution. And then by looking at the difference in absorbance between left and right polarized light, you can have a look at the structure. Now in this, in this experiment, the absorbance at 220 nanometers is a signal of helicity. So if you do this experiment in a solution, a buffer solution with no salt at all, you've got about 34% helicity, which means that about 34% of this disordered protein on average at any one time is helical. If you add one mole, mole sodium chloride or potassium chloride, you actually find that you lose about a third of that helicity. So adding some salt melts out the structure. What was really remarkable about this experiment and what nobody ever suspected was if you take the same ionic strength of calcium chloride or magnesium chloride, so this is the same ionic strength, so about 0.3 molar uh, of these, you lose half the overall helicity. That means that in a cell, if you get changes in the, in the ionic content of a cell, if you get, for instance, around ion channels and influx of calcium, you can actually change the interactions of disordered proteins that are around that. And, and what, what, what Basil was able to show was that by changing the helicity, you could actually change the affinity of the complex that this protein made. Now, is this just, well, one of those interesting things that biophysicists are interesting just because they're interesting, or is it important? Well, actually, no, it does matter in biology. Let's go back to that really exquisite structure that I told you about before, the F1 ATPase. To remind you, or those of you who never did biochemistry or, or, or biophysics in your time, um, this is the molecular motor made up of many different components that makes ATP. What you have here is a proton motive force. So, so you've, you, 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 you've got hydrogen ions flowing out of this system and it's that proton pump, which is driving this, this rotatory motor. It rotates and the rotation of this motor cause ADP to produce ATP. And that is important because it drives all the interactions in your cell. Now, if you get to a point in the cell where the proton motive force is dissipated, let's say you've got low oxygen conditions and you start running out of, you, you run out, you're running down this proton gradient. What you don't want this motor to do is run backwards. And it does run backwards. In fact, when we make pictures of this using single molecule fluorescence, we actually, we actually make it run backwards. So it does run backwards and that would be disastrous for the cell. So what happens is we need to stop that in biology. So we've got a protein called IF1, which inhibits this. What IF1 does, it binds to one of the three catalytic sites here between the alpha and the beta subunits and it, it binds and it stops the rotation and stops hydrolysis of the ATP, stops rotation and you no longer get this happening. Okay, now what's interesting about this is it's the disordered region of IF1 which um, interacts with this site there's a disordered region which becomes helical and binds. When John Walker, the, the Nobel Prize winner, read Basil's work on that, he contacted us and Vaitote and, and Basil did some work to find out what was going on. And in, in, indeed, we found that this disordered region changed its structure when you changed the pH or the calcium. What happened is that that caused the, the changes in pH and ionic strength caused it to go from an inactive form as a, as a tetramer to an active form as a monomer. 
And so what we concluded in this work was that this inhibitor is able to change to stool structures in pH and salt, and you get calcium influx in the mitochondria. Um, it, it enabled it to be sensitive to these changes. And so it's because IF1 is disordered that you could have exquisite and rapid response to changes in the pH or in the calcium content of the mitochondria so that you did could turn on and off um, the, you, you could turn on and off this pump according to the needs of the cell. We also know that small changes in, small changes in sequence can affect the binding of these intrinsically disordered regions. And these changes of sequence can be outside the binding region. This is really peculiar. How does that work? Well, this is another example where we know that this has a biological function. There's a protein called P53. All of you in this audience should have heard of P53, I hope. P53 is kind of like, like the big gatekeeper of the cell, the, 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 the protein which is, stops you getting cancer. In about a third of cancers, you have mutations in P53. So P53 is an enormously important protein. P53 is controlled by interactions with this protein called MDM, MDM2. So in your normal cells, you've got P53 detecting, uh, and P53 is the guardian of the cell and it detects damage in, in DNA. And if it finds DNA damage, it will, it will trigger, trigger apoptosis, partly through the BCL2 system I talked to you about before. It, it, it also promotes production of its own inhibitor, MDM2, because you need to turn over P53 in the cells to have it function properly. <clears throat> now, in P53, there are two proline residues, one here and one and, and two here, minus four and minus two, outside this binding region. So here's the disordered region of P53, that when it, when it binds to, its, to MDM2, which is this gray protein here, forms a helix and then goes off to be destroyed uh, um, it, by the proteolytic system in the cell. Right, if you mutate, these proline residues, which again are outside the binding site, you get an increase in the helicity of this, this thing. So it, it by, it's more likely to be helical. You find actually that this complex lives twice as long if you mutate these residues out, or sorry, 10 times as long, which is results in a 10 times lifetime. And what happens with this is, this now, increasing the life in this complex, impairs P53's ability to promote cell cycle arrest. So having intrinsic disorder is absolutely essential to this P53 to control the lifetime of the complex with MDM2, which then controls its ability to promote cell cycle arrest. The final thing I want to talk to you about that makes IDPs exquisitely sensitive to changing conditions is the presence of a membrane. Now, what we know about eukaryotic cells is that membranes are everywhere. Um, and in order to understand this, I want to go back again to this BCL2 system, which I was talking to you about earlier. Um, What Basil tried to do in this experiment and was to try and model what happens in this BCL2 system. You will remember what I said is we've got these three classes of proteins. We've got the pro-survival folded BCL2 proteins. We've got the intrinsically disordered pro-apoptotic BH3 only proteins, the disordered proteins. And then we've got these folded 
pro-apoptotic, pro-death proteins back and bats. And during normal life, these two are interacting together somehow. When P53 de detects intracellular damage, these BH3 proteins are produced and somehow turn on back and backs to, pu to punch the mitochondria. So this is what we were trying to look at. What's the mechanism for this? So here we have the tripartite system. Puma is going to be our intrinsically disordered partner. MCL1 is just one of the BCL2 proteins. This is the folded protein. And back and backs, we're going to use both of these. What we know is, in, in health, MCL1 interacts with back. Read it in the literature, we know it's there, and we know it interacts through binding to this point here. And the cell is happy. We know that when there's cell damage, Puma comes along, this disordered protein, and somehow this promotes back to form pores in the cell membrane of the mitochondria, which causes cell death. How does this work? Well, we're biophysicists. We study protein-protein interactions. We're good at that. We know how to do this. Let's have a go. So um, we know, because we read it in the literature, that all these things can interact with each other, and they do it through this, this motif. What I didn't tell you is, each of these proteins has a motif here, which is homologous to this. And so they can, all the parts combined with each other. So this motif from here combined here, this motif from here combined here, this combined with this, and this combined with this. So we could do all that and we could measure all the interaction strengths and we, we confirmed that this all works, but we could put numbers on it, which I'm not gonna bother with about today, but I've got the numbers if you're interested. So we did all this, we know all this works. But then we came across a real problem. We know this to be true because everybody's shown this in the literature, that these two are interacting with each other. But when we make these proteins, they don't. No matter what we did here, we could not get these two to interact at any concentrations, even though all the literature tells us they do. And we couldn't understand this. Now, one of the things that, we, that you need to have if you're a scientist is you need to be lucky. And Basil is a lucky scientist. I'm showing you now here a native mass spec of Bax. So, here is Bax on its own. You can see that it's monomeric. This is a native mass spec. In this mass spectrum, some of you will understand how to look at a mass spectrum, but this is where you take the protein, you fly it through a mass spec. Here are the ions flying through. Here's Bax with seven positive charges. Here's with eight positive charges. Here's with nine positive charges. It's a single protein. Um, but what Basil did when he first tried to purify this protein is he added a tiny bit of detergent just because he just had some buffer that had a bit of detergent, stop it being sticky. When he did this with detergent, he observed that he didn't just see monomers of this protein, just single copies of this protein. He found copies that were more proteins that were, that were flying through the mass spec as dimers as tetramers, as hexamers. What he found was if he added a detergent, a detergent which is a mimic of the cell membrane, Bax on its own was forming these pore-like complexes. It was forming multimers that looked like pores. So here is the mass spec results as a summary. If I took, if he took back or backs on its own and let it fly in a mass spec or any other technique that we could do to detect what it was flying as, it was always a single protein on its own. However, when you added a detergent, 
as well as seeing the single proteins, you could always see multimeric forms of these proteins. We could also, I'm not showing the data, show that when you added detergent, it caused a structural change in back or back, which allowed this to happen. Right. What happened then when we took back and MCL1? Now, I've already told you that BAC and MCL1 don't interact together. We told you that. We don't. What happens when we add detergent now? Here's the mass spec I already showed you. If I take BAC or BACs on their own with detergent, I get single, doubles, multiple copies. If I now take BAC with MCL1, all these multiple copies go. All I see is back and MCL1 flying together, one-to-one -one complexes of back and MCL1. In other words, when I add detergent, whatever the detergent was doing to back now makes it open to forming complexes with MCL1 as well. Now, what happens when I add that disordered protein, that Puma protein? What does Puma do? Now what Puma does, this blue square here, it takes MCL1, it's got a higher affinity for MCL1 than MCL1 does for BAC, or, M or, or Puma does for BAC, and it sucks up all the, BAC, all the MCL1, which now releases the BAC and BAC to go off and form these multimeric complexes, which can punch a hole into the mitochondrial cell membrane. So here's the results there. On their own, all these things are monomeric. You add a detergent that mimics the cell membrane. In normal times, when the cell is happy, back will, MCL1 will suck up all the back and backs and keep the cells safe. When Puma comes in, Puma will suck up all the MCL1 freeing back and backs to form these complexes, which can then form these, the, these uh, um, which can then form the um, pores in the cell. So this is the mechanism which we believe is, is calling this. It's a direct activ activation mechanism caused simply because the, this blue protein, this disordered protein, has a different affinity for um, MCL1 than it, than it does from back and backs, causing this. So our answer to our question that we set at the beginning, and I, and I set to you at the beginning, was that Intrinsically disordered proteins here are exquisitely are used by biology because they're exquisitely sensitive to changes in conditions. Where do you find these proteins in cells? You find them precisely where you need the cell to respond to signals. You find them in, um, in transcription factors. You find them in systems like this, it, that need that the systems that I've shown you, that need to correspond very quickly to changes in cellular conditions. You find them in, histone, in histones. These are systems where the cell needs to turn things on and off rapidly in response to conditions. And that's why we think why intrinsically disordered proteins are used um, in, these, in these cell signaling complexes. Of course, this now sets us a problem. If you think about drugs, if you think about trying to design drugs and everything you've learned in chemistry and these things about looking at pockets in drugs and then designing small molecules to fit those pockets, this makes it very difficult because we're designing molecules to interfere with systems which are highly disordered which makes it extraordinarily difficult to drug these systems. But the only way we're going to move forward in some of these diseases is by looking at how we can drug these. 
So our con my conclusion, our conclusion is that in biology, disorder is not always a bad thing. And of course, in biology, when I say we, um, one of my, uh, my students once said, when I said we in a group meeting, he said, Jane, you mean the supervisor we? And I, I, I said, what do you mean the supervisor we? And he said, well, you've got the normal we, shall we go to the pub? You've got the royal we, we are pleased to open this building today. And you've got the supervisor we, we need to do some more experiments, which means actually you need to do some more experiments. And these are the people who did all this work. Um, the, the work on, on, on Puma uh, uh, and the, 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 um, the promiscuity was done by, by a large number of these people, Michael, Tristan, Lisa, Carol, Quentin, um, Sarah, Basil Wiki did all the work on, on the BCL2 families. We've co we collaborated with, with Carol from Car Carol Robinson's group in Oxford and Vartorte from John Walker's group here in Cambridge. And, and of course this work was, couldn't have been done uh, without all these funding bodies. So that's the science part of the work. And um, if you use the chat, I'm sure that you can, uh, if any of you have chat questions and things, you can do that. Um, and I'd happily ask, answer questions for those of you who are looking online streaming. I, I'd be happy to answer questions if you email them to me. But what I want to go on to now, uh, the second part of my, my session, is to really talk about you, you young scientists, and to reflect about scientific careers and what the current world disorder is doing to science and, and looking at whether it's bad. Um, I think things have been pretty worrying uh, for more than just, I mean, I'm not talking about the last six months. I think there have been worrying trends in science um, that I've detected for quite a while. Um, here's a sign, uh, 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 really, uh, uh, you know, um, Brexit, in my opinion, could be disastrous for British science. Um, you know, the loss of the ERC, the loss of the Horizon 10 funding, um, the loss of the mobility, the easy mobility of scientists to and from Europe, and uh, um, it, it could be disastrous. But also this kind of attitude here, people in this country have had enough of experts. Um, uh, I, 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 and this sort of idea that scientists, you know, we've had enough of scientists, is the sort of thing that has led to, to you know, to people dying of measles because people think that, because uh, the anti-vaxxers have had such a say, because people like this have made it respectable to distrust science and evidence. Um, so when I was sort of putting this together, I thought, well, surely it's better now. I mean, now should be a great time to be a scientist because people are realizing how important scientists are. You know, we need scientists to give us clues about how to deal with this pandemic. We need scientists to devise new vaccines that might get us out of this pandemic. We need scientists to run the labs to do testing. I have to say, I'm not convinced that in the long run, we're going to go there. Um, Politicians are using scientists, um, but you know this is this. Um, the Times Higher Educational Supplement said, you know that that the confused claim to follow the science is going to erode public trust in scientists. I mean, everybody's following the science, and they're all doing different things. What's going on? And I would argue it's because people don't understand science. Um, um, here is a report that suggests that public trust in scientists will decline in the wake of COVID-19. There's a study suggesting that the confidence in science will maintain, but, but coronavirus will damage people's perception of scientists. That's you and me, um, which I think is worrying. There's also, of course, the damage that has done to scientists themselves. Here's, here's Neil Ferguson, um, who was one of the chief government advisors, he's a modeler, get that? He's a modeler, he does what science does. He makes a model, which may or may not be predictive, it's a model. 
What's happened to him? Well, first of all, um, he's called Professor Pants Down because his private life was uh, intruded into, but by by the tabloid press who took pictures of his married uh, lover coming to visit him. Uh, let's not let's not wonder what the effect was that was on her children. And then, of course, they'll find other experts who are slamming him for being totally unreliable. Um, this is, I mean, what we do as scientists is put a, a hypothesis out there and then we test it. To have science um, pre put out a, 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 and painted in this way, I think we have to be prepared for it to be severely damaging. And it matters. It really matters. Because we have people, these pictures here, you know, going out saying we should not be wearing masks. We, sh you know, vaccine will kill millions more than COVID. Um, don't believe the liberal media. Um, it really matters what people think of science and scientists and experts. So I want to look a tiny bit, reflect a tiny bit and ask you to reflect on what science is, because if we, the scientists, are not going out there and challenging what's going to happen, then it will be a bad effect for you and for everybody. So what's science? Science is not what lots of people think it is, a, a whole load of facts. It's a way of finding things out. It's a method. We make an observation. We're curious. We want to solve a problem. So we formulate a hypothesis, we test that hypothesis, we reject or we fail to reject the hypothesis. Then we come up with a new hypothesis or a model and we test it again. What we don't do is say we know what's happening. Uh, and we have to make sure that we explain this to people, that scientists don't know things, they propose models, they come up with, with ideas about how things might work. Um, what's research? Well, um, here's a strict definition of research, um, which I've just given you really, but I, I like this definition of research best. If we knew what it was we're doing, it wouldn't be research, would it? Um, research is a complete leap into the unknown. And of course, that's what makes science is so fun. Um, who does the science? Well, you can go on Google and look at who does the science and this is what science looks like. They, they mostly look mad and they all wear white coats, that's for sure. Um, but in my opinion, these are scientists. They're people with curiosity and imagination. They're courageous. They'll try things even if they don't work. They don't mind being wrong. Um, they're creative. They're resourceful. And they have flexible minds. And I think anything which tries to force us into boxes, try to make us lose any of these, um, uh, uh, any of, of these gifts that children have in abundance is awful. And I do worry about the state of school science, particularly in a time when children are being sort of forced to do science um, sort of in a safe way, socially distanced. You know, experiments are going to go. In, in Cambridge, there's going to be no part 1A experiments this year. That's that's the damage this COVID has done to, has done to us. Um, uh, 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 and I think we need to be aware of that. These are also scientists. Um, I, I, I'm afraid you were told a lie at the beginning. I, I Unfortunately, in Cambridge, you have to retire at 67, and I was 67 in 2017. And this was uh, my retirement symposium, and these were the people um, that I had worked with over, over the years. I, uh, I, I only had 20 years because I started my PhD when I was 40. But, um, you know, these are the people I had in my lab. And who were they? Well, they were chemists. Um, they were biochemists, they were physicists, they were computer scientists, they were engineers. I had a huge variety because the important thing that we all know about research today, scientific research is it's multidisciplinary. They were from the UK, they were from Europe, they were from, the, from, from North America, they were from South America, from Africa, from Asia and Australia. Australasia. I don't have 
uh, one of them here, but, but they were from all those places. Because what we know today is that research is international. And what are our governments doing? They're trying to cut down and make it more difficult for foreigners to come to stay here, uh, to come to our countries. And I would argue it's vital for science to have research, research mobility. It's vital for us to have diverse research teams because research is this leap into the unknown. We need to build research environments where people have got different skills and will look at problems in different ways. We need to build environments where we're going to be challenged about our secure place. And if everybody that is in our labs did the same degree in the same places from the same country, we will lose that. We need places where hierarchy, deference and power, knowledge and wisdom are constantly under scrutiny and where we're encouraged to be wrong, because it's only by being wrong that we learn things. The most exciting times in my scientific career have when students have come to me and said, the results don't make sense. When they've gone back and done it again and again, and the results still don't make sense, that's we've discovered something new. Let's look at this picture of scientists again. Well, here's a question. Where are the women? Where are the people of color? Perhaps they're professors. Well, certainly not professors, are they? Um, you know, it's not a single woman professor here. There's a basketball player, but not a woman professor in this look in this Google search of professors. Um, professor McGonagall is in the next screen down. Um, look for women scientists, though, and now we get a better picture. Not only do we see a lot of women scientists, but what do we see? We see a lot of diverse scientists, that women of color. And, uh, and why do we see that? Because the scientists here are overwhelmingly young, apart from this one who's dead, um, but they're overwhelmingly young. And where are all the women scientists? Well, it's a problem of retention. The data I'm gonna show you here are about retention of women, but, but the data on retention of of other minorities are harder to get to come by. But the, the picture of retention is we can attract great people to come into science at undergraduate level of all kinds, but then we lose them. They leak. We have this leaky pipe syndrome. So let's reflect and wonder who's to blame? Why? Now, it, is, it could be true that it is the absolute unalterable nature of science and academia that means men are just better at it. Well, if any of you out there believe that to be true, and there are people that do, you know, there are people that do that, I refuse to believe that. Because if you think about it, who's doing the science? It's, it's the graduate students and the postdocs who are doing the science. It's not the old white men sitting in their offices and don't know where their lab is. So the people doing the science are, are, are the younger scientists and we've seen there the younger scientists are more diverse. So I refuse to believe it. Perhaps it's something wrong with the women. Perhaps there's something about the women, the people of color that means they just don't have what it takes to stick to it. And there are people who actually believe this. Um, you will remember this terrible thing in, in 2015, where Tim Hunt, a Nobel Prize winner said, the trouble with girls is that you fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. There was an outpouring of outrage at that time. I remember lying in bed, hearing him say this on the Today program and jumping up in fury and almost spilling my tea. Um, but a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, he said, you, you know, you women shouldn't make a fuss. They don't have a sense of humor. Of course, he didn't mean it. Well, we do have a sense of humor, in fact. And I loved women all over the world, their response to this. They apologized for being you know, uh, crying and being distractingly sexy and so forth. But, you know, Tim Hunt was... Um, an older scientist, maybe he was he was something, a product of his time. And of course, it's not like that anymore. Well, in the Royal Society survey 2018, only two years ago, one of the male respondents said this. And, and I will read it to you. I know you can all read, but it, it just makes me shocked. 
Women choose to have families, which is very significant responsibility and not compatible with a competitive career as a professional chemist. Well, well, last time I heard about it, men chose to have families as well. Why is it not compatible for men chemists? Women face zero discrimination. I'm glad all the women here know this. Let's cross this off and put people of color face zero discrimination. Quite the opposite. Women chemists are encouraged at every opportunity. There are still people out there, the world we're living in, that's populated by people who do think it's women's fault. Women should. I refuse to believe that. Uh, but there are people that do. So the question that you might come to is, is it the system? This is a wonderful article, and I quote it all the time, by this person, uh, uh, I've, I've Francis Hocutt, and she's, she was a, an organic chemist and she left. And she said, when the pipeline leaks, we don't blame the water. We fix the pipe and we design the next one to leak less. Why do we blame women who leave STEM? In this article, she leaves us with a lot of challenges. What should you do? And the thing that strikes me, the most important thing here as president of this college is at Wilson College is here it says you see your organization welcomes diversity instead of paying lip service to that and that is what we need to do and there are a whole of load of specific things which she says that we we need to do but she says that we make it so she faces only the same pressures and frustration as her straight male fully abled white I would add co-workers that's what we need to do. It's a challenge to the system. And so now we've got the pandemic. What are the effects of that? Well, there's gonna be huge effects on funding. I was speaking to the head of the CRUK just today, and he said they've lost a huge 150 million pound reduction in income. We've got to expect a recession. And I know that there are students who failed to come to Cambridge this year, because the government who was going to fund them have cut in their funding on scholarships. There have been effects on a career, career scientist. I don't need to tell you this. You've been shut out of your labs. You haven't been able to do research. And even now you come back and that you've lost the opportunity to work as a team, having a big team where you're all working together, talking together, sharing experience, sharing ideas all the time. Jobs in academia and some industries are gonna be lost. I hope you're working in virology. Um, this is really important, the loss of conferences and networking opportunities. Uh, one of the books I've read recently is this book by Adam, Adam Rutherford, and he talks about uh, going to conferences and he says, every scientist knows the most productive conversations happen in a bar. And he talks about going to conferences and you hear all those talks and everything. He says, but it's in the bar that the science gets scrutinized. The ideas are assembled lifelong collaborations are made. That's where networking is done. That's where young scientists in particular are being harmed by this because they're missing out on those, those, those opportunities. We may be lucky to have these opportunities to have these online conferences such as this one, which is fantastic, but we're not going to the bar after this and we've lost it. The effect on diversity in science, well, Analysis suggests that female academics are posting fewer pre-check prints and publishing fewer research projects. The pandemic, yeah, it's like we're going back 30 years. Read this article, how the coronavirus is gutting diversity in science. It's sabotaging the careers of these researchers and it suggests that institutions can help staunch the flow. And it's the responsibility of senior people in institutions, and I'm pointing at myself here, to do something about the effects of this. Now, <laughs> I hope that you haven't been depressed by this last thing, because I don't, I don't want to encourage you to do this. What I want to do is arm you and say, start looking around, start thinking and start making your plans how you're going to manage this. But I would not encourage anybody to give up. I was a school teacher till I was 40, and that's when I started my PhD, and it's been the best thing to me. I love being a research scientist. I cannot tell you 
how I mourned when I had to shut, shut my lab down. In fact, my final PhD student was actually crying as we were throwing away the plasmids. Life's too short to do something you don't love. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, stop it and find something else to do. I spend all day every day in my old job and this with some of the brightest young people in the world. Who couldn't do that? Academia job is a brilliant job to combine with parenthood. When I was a teacher, I couldn't go do things with my kids. When I was an academic, I was flexible enough to be able to do it. And I found friends and mentors across the world, lifelong friends. So here's my final pieces of advice. When you find these friends and mentors, cherish them, nurture them, and support them back. A supportive family is really, really important. So if you haven't already done, choose your partner in life and choose your children very, very carefully. Make sure your children aren't sick very often. It is worth it, I promise you. Stick to it, you will love it. Don't forget to ask for help and support. Don't be shy, get a mentor. I'm a mentor of many young scientists uh, through, the, through the National Academy of Medical Sciences, actually, and if you need help and support, find it. Those people in Cambridge, you want someone to talk to, email me, come and see me. I'd be happy to support you. Uh, and my very final piece of advice, for any of you, as soon as you get a job and you can afford it, get a cleaner. Because in, that is the thing that's helped me most to, to get a good life work balance. So thank you so much for coming along. I'll stop showing my screen now. And if there's any questions or comments, I'd be pleased to hear them. Otherwise, thank you for coming. And it's been great to be here. Thank you very much, Jane, for your wonderful talk and a uh, thought-provoking one. So uh, I'm now uh, taking questions from both YouTube and Zoom. Uh, so if you're on Zoom, you could choose to ask your questions in person or post it on the chat or send them to me. Or OK, I, I do see one question here on Zoom. Um, would you mind sharing your personal challenges as a woman, as a woman in science? Sorry. Um, I actually have a slide somewhere that does that. Um, but but let um, yes. So um, what have my challenges been? Um, loneliness. If you're the only woman around, um, it can be lonely. Um, and, and I found that really hard. Um, learning to live with the guilt. I remember I was at a conference last summer and, and I met somebody and she said, oh, she started work late. No, she started her career late. She was doing a PhD. She had kids. And she said, what's the main challenges? And I said, the guilt. And she burst into tears <laughs> because she always felt guilty. She always felt guilty when she was wor at work because she wasn't at home with her kids, looking after her kids. And she always felt guilty when she left work early and people were sort of going, well, oh, it's four o'clock, what are you leaving work for? That she wasn't at work working harder. Um, and so learning to be good enough. Once my son said to me, why aren't you a proper mummy, mummy? And his question was, well, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, Debbie, that was his childminder, Debbie makes cake. So from that moment on, I decided to buy cake um, because you've you got to do something. Um, yeah, loneliness. Um, and, 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 and getting that life work balance right. But, but I, think, I think the loneliness and guilt, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, there's one question. So um, what influenced your decision to go back to science and do a PhD after having a successful career in education? Uh, just, just accident. Um, 
my my ambition i love teaching actually i were um i really did love it and and i do think that those of my phd students who become teachers are those who in some ways i feel are going to make the most difference in the world um but my husband was a banker and we went to live in atlanta and i couldn't teach in atlanta because i didn't have georgia history and college english um, so I went back to university, I went to George Tech uh, to do a master's just to update my science, you know, that then I'd be, be a better science teacher when I went back. And I just fell in love with doing research. I just, I, I couldn't imagine not being able to do research. So I came, I was, we, so when we returned, so I did a part-time master's. Um, and so when we returned to the UK, uh, we live near Cambridge, so I came to Cambridge. I knew I wanted to work on the relationship between protein sequence and protein structure and function. That was what I wanted to do. So I went to the biochemistry department and I said, here I am, uh, I want to work with you. And they said, you're 40 years old, you've got two children, go away. I mean, somebody actually said to me, who would look after your children? And I said, it is none of your business. He didn't offer me a PhD place. But um, one of the people in Georgia Tech had given me a letter for Alan first. And so he just moved to Cambridge. He was a top protein chemist in the world. So I went to see him and he said, sure, start in October and your stipend will pay for your childcare. And do you know what? He never, ever, ever cared how many hours I did in the lab. He only cared what I had achieved. What did you accomplish? Not how high, how deep, but how good you know, what have you done? And that's a real good lesson. And he's been a supporter and mentor of mine for life. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so perhaps one last question. Um, how do you think the, the climate in science has changed in terms of uh, encouraging women to participate in science and also um, encouraging diversity in science? Um, I think it's, I think it's got, I think that this, I do think that it is now acknowledged that this is important. I, I think that people in position of power, um, I mean, like Dame Sally Davis, when she was um, chief medical officer, she did a huge amount of good by just saying to all, all people that wanted money um, uh, to do research from the, NIH, uh, the, the NHS, uh, you know, from me medical research, uh, had to have the Athena Swan Silver Award or they wouldn't get it. So I do think it's important. I do think it's empowered women uh, at, to work together. I don't think enough work is being done looking at other minorities. Um, uh, and it's partly because data is hard to come by. Um, I, I'm, I'm working with the Royal Society and the Wellcome Trust in these areas as well. Um, but I think that there's a still hard and fast idea that it is meritocratic. So I think people always think they're choosing the best. Unconscious bias is, is heinous. And I... I'm pleased that people are noticing, but I don't know that it's going fast enough for me. My granddaughter is now eight. Will, by the time she's 18, things have improved so that she no longer faces the sorts of barriers that young women do now? I'm not confident. I know that she already thinks that maths is for boys. She's only eight, but she thinks maths and science is for boys. Well, she certainly didn't get it from her from her mother, who's a scientist. Well, who's a, who's a, who's a, who's a doctor, uh, a medical doctor. Shame, lost her from science. Uh, I certainly didn't get it from her grandmother, but she got it when she went to school. Um, and until we have, you know, if you look what's happened to. To, to, we're, we're talking about women academics, women who are all group leaders in academic institutions 
have fallen behind their male peers during this six months of COVID because they're publishing less. Do you know why? Because they're looking after their children. Their male peers are at home saying, oh, this is great. I can write another research grant and I can get these papers done. So until we change society, we won't change. It's getting better. And I think that, that women and people of color and people with disabilities who are in science now will find it easier to get support. But whether the surrounding infrastructure is good enough to support them, that's what I don't know. But stick with it. It's worth it. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Um, sorry, uh, would you mind answering just one more question? No, that's fine. Okay, there's one question from YouTube. What are the difficulties making drug tackling disordered system? Will, what will this mean to the future of drug discovery? Um, we are seeing increasingly that simple inhibitor don't, inhibitors don't work for complex diseases. Mm. I think it means it will be difficult. I, I think you've answered your own question in, in asking that question. Um, I, I, I think that it will be difficult. Um, we will have to go, I mean, you know, the, 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 the idea that we'll be able to do drug design by in silico design, it will not work for these systems. So I think that using things that, I mean, antibodies, um, we just had a paper published with some, some people that we work with in Leeds who've managed to raise aphimers, which are sort of by, by, by selection, which are sort of non-antibody binders. I think we're going to have to use um, selection to get to get binders to these flexible areas we, we're not going to be able to use computational design so one of the sort of sort of gold targets was to be able to use computational design to design molecules to fit into crevices in proteins but now that we know that these these crevices are flex flexible and that the proteins we're trying to design against are themselves flexible we're going to have to use selection and, and, and get even better at, at fast selection than we are at computational design. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'll now wrap up the talk. So um, thank you once again, Professor Clark, for sharing her research on uh, intrinsically disordered proteins and how cells meet them um, to respond rapidly to changes in the cellular environment. Um, also her thoughts on threats and um, threats and in, in science and, sorry? Challenges is, I think the word challenges is better than threats. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes, challenges in science and, and how we could hopefully solve them um, or try to alleviate the situation. And also personally, I, I found one common message um, from between this talk and the first keynote uh, talk by uh, Professor Kim Naismith from Oxford, which is, um, so he believes that we shouldn't explain science in terms of things that we already know. So um, this is exactly uh, the same as uh, your message in your, one of the messages in your talk, uh, which says that we really need creativity and imagination in science to make science better. So once again, thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. So um, we have one more session tonight, uh, which will be on physics and medical physics. So hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor. Bye-bye. Okay, we're off. Uh, thank